Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Research America Alliance member web meeting. And thanks, as always, to all of you in the audience um, for joining us and to our Alliance members for your partnership. Um, we have terrific guest speakers today. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, uh, first, I'm so pleased um, to have with us Benjamin Yerksa. He's the CEO of the Foundation Fighting Blindness and the Retinal De Degeneration Fund. Um, Karen Petru, who is the managing partner of Federal Financial Analytics Incorporated, and Lauren Citron, who is Congressman Bobby Rush's legislative director. Um, they'll speak with us about a bill Congressman Rush plans to introduce that takes aim at the medical progress limiting valley of death in medical R&D financing. Um, after we hear from Ben, Karen, and Lauren, we'll hear from Dr. Al Renez. He's a nationally recognized surgeon and leader at his community hospital in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Ruins has um, received his medical degree at Columbia, completed his residency at Duke University, um, member organizations of ours, <laughs> and he'll discuss the challenges that community hospitals have faced as COVID-19 bore down on our nation, um, as well as the ongoing challenges that this virus poses for uh, providers um, and patients, all of us, um, his perspective on pandemic preparedness going forward from um, a look at the local level. And um, housekeeping, as I'm sure you all know by now, um, type your questions into the Q&A box at any time as we go along. And my colleague, Terry Schwartzbeck, will pose as many as she can during the Q&A. Now, um, we're gonna kick off by sharing a video from the Congressman himself. So Congressman Rush um, will talk about his uh, new proposal. Um, why don't you go ahead and run the video, Terry, if you would. Good afternoon. My name is Congressman Bobby L. Rush. I'm proud to represent the first congressional district of Illinois, and I am excited about my new bill, the Loan for Biomedical Research Act, which I am preparing to introduce along with my colleague, Representative Brian Fitzpatrick. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has halted important clinical trials for treatments and for cures for diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, blindness, sickle cell anemia, and many others. Hundreds of clinical trials remain disrupted. We must use every avenue at our disposal to restart and maximize my biomedical research. That is why I am proud to be the lead sponsor of this important piece of legislation. Our bill will authorize a federally backed guarantee for loans for clinical trials that have already been cleared by the FDA. Frankly, it is past time for bold and innovation to increase funding for biomedical research. We need the Loans Act and we need it now. However, Representative Fitzpatrick, and I cannot do this alone, support from organizations like yours are critical to the success of this bill. I'm so sorry that I cannot be with you today, and I sincerely hope to have the chance to speak with you in person soon. But for now, I'm leaving you in good hands. My legislative director, Lauren Citron, is happy to answer questions, and as is Karen from the Federal Fighting Blindness Federation, who has been working closely with my office on this important piece of legislation. Thank you for all your hard work on behalf of research, on behalf of patients, and I look forward to working with you moving forward on the loans for Biomedical Research Act. Thank you and goodbye. Wonderful. Lauren, could you please express our our gratitude 
to the congressman. We look forward to working with him too, as always. Um, so let me turn it over to Ben, I think, to kick off, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sounds good. Well, th thanks, Ellie. Thanks, everyone. Um, hey, I'm Ben Yerksa. I'm CEO of Foundation Funding Blindness. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to tell you why the foundation is supporting the BioBonds initiative. As, as a disease foundation, you know, we're a nonprofit and a charity. We're a very narrow and deep research funder. Our, our therapeutic area is essentially like our North Star. Uh, and we fund only within that narrow slice of biomedical research. And that makes sense to us and is consistent with most, if not probably all of our peers. Uh, and we know that our funding is a drop in the bucket compared to government funding from NIH, NSF, DOD, DARPA, et cetera. But at least our funds often create a bridge to those bigger dollars. And that's why essentially at a policy level, we're always supportive of meritorious initiatives to increase funding for biomedical research in general. It's the rising tides floats all boats mentality. And, and that's why we're supportive of biobonds, even if it's novel and seemingly untested, more from Karen on that, um, because it's an opportunity to inject meaningful capital into the system across the board therapeutically for programs that have made it at least past the IND stage gate. And this is a good first step in our view and, and less complicated to get off the ground. And with the delays incurred due to COVID, we believe there's a lot to catch up on. So you all know there's a lot of venture capital out there now, but you also know that venture capital waxes and wanes. So having an alternative financial vehicle can be really powerful and complementary to the current situation. Uh, I even have my own observational data from a biomedical loan program done at the state level here in North Carolina. It's a highly successful state-run program. That gives me confidence this can be scaled to the national level. So like a lot of novel ideas, there will be naysayers. And frankly, you know, we expect some resistance. And if there were none, then we haven't pushed hard enough, right? <laughs> so, so supporting biobonds is essentially a missional imperative for us. And we hope that you will see the alignment with your respective missions. So what we need from you are two things at the moment. Uh, one, if you're so inclined, uh, after today, sign on to the support letter along with dozens of other uh, organizations have done so already. And two, help us get more co-sponsors in Congress to help support the bill upon its introduction later this month. So with that, I'll hand it over to Karen uh, to walk you through some of the aspects of the bill. Thank you very much, Ben. I am very pleased to, to be here today with you. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Lauren. I am a, a proud a member of the board of directors of the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, but I'm also, as Ellie said, managing partner of a firm called Federal Financial Analytics that uh, my late husband and I founded. And we advise some of the largest financial services firms and central banks around the world on financial policy. And going back a while, we were thinking, why is it, as Ben says, there's now there's a lot of venture capital out, but it's often, even now, very difficult to get at the early translational stages. And of course, venture capital is quite expensive. And because my day job is in the financial markets, I, we looked at a phenomenon called green bonds. Another critical policy need, as you all know, is global warming, climate change. And in 2007, one of the World Bank organizations backed a green bond of about $100 million with a guarantee. So companies that made loans to green projects um, were able to sell those loans to investors who didn't worry about the risk because they had a guarantee. That kick-started a private market, which now has both guaranteed and unguaranteed green bonds and other investments. And we went from 2007, one bond of $100 million to last year, even in the midst of the COVID, a global market of over $600 billion. And that's what Congressman Rush's bill is aimed at doing, creating a bio bond market akin to the green bond market. So we tap not just philanthropists, foundations, patient communities, but also Wall Street to fund early stage through the translational process research cleared by the FDA through much lower cost funding, which are loans. And the bonds put together of the loans to the researchers would be backed by a 90% federal guarantee. This would be a three-year pilot program of $10 billion a year in guarantees backing the principle of each loan. 
and researchers would be able to have to demonstrate their credit worthiness, but many from what we've seen would be fully able to do that. And for them, this means that as they work through, they will keep the stake in their research. The funding will be much less expensive as they develop other sources of revenue. They can pay the loan back, keep the market going. And bit by bit, we hope that this educates long-term, low cost sources of patient financial capital like insurance companies and pension funds to support biomedical research over the 10 years to 15 year period it takes to go from the end of basic research into the, uh, from, as we often say, from bench to bedside. Now I know we don't have much time. So those are really the key features of the bill. $10 billion a year in federal guarantees for the principal amount of bonds that are comprised of loans to biomedical researchers across the spectrum of disease and disability, as Congressman Rush said. It's not just blindness, it's cancer, it's Alzheimer's, rare diseases, pediatric, geriatric disorders. With FDA clearance, that's all the borrower would have to demonstrate as long with capacity to repay for the tenor, the amount of time the loan would be outstanding. New funding source, not everybody will want it, but as Ben said, the more money for biomedical research, the faster the treatment and cure. Look, we saw that. If you had asked, I think anybody on this call, how long would it take to come up with a, with a vaccine to fight COVID in the ordinary course of, of biomedical research, it would have taken years. And the economics of doing it were not good. That's why nobody even thought about doing it. You throw a lot of money at a problem because the public policy, the federal government says we need to solve this and we have a vaccine, a remarkably effective one in, at warp speed, quite literally. And we really feel that $10 billion a year in additional funding and hopefully as the market grows considerably more would make an enormous difference in speeding treatments and cures. Let me stop there, I know Ben, and I, along with Lauren, would be happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Um, I just wanted to address one that came in through chat. And um, unfortunately, the way our system works, I'm not sure we can respond to chat except to panelists, even though it comes in from our audience. So um, Ben um, or I, we'd be glad to forward you the sign-on letter that Foundation Fighting Blindness is circulating. Um, I don't know that we have a link to it, so I don't know if we can put it in the chat. Um, if not, you know, just email. Oops, it just came up. Hopefully you all can see that there's a link. Um, so one question I have, uh, um, I'd like to address to, to Ben. You mentioned that in North Carolina, there's a, probably not an identical, but a model mm -hmm. that, um, how do they evaluate which applications would be eligible for, for the loans under this program, under their, their program, do you know? Yeah, so it is different. It's, um, it's for startup companies, so they're a little bit earlier in their stage. Um, so many of them are not quite at the ID stage, but uh, you know, it's basically vetted and diligence by the staff at the center. Again, it's a state supported effort, a nonprofit effort and um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a big portfolio of loans that have been administered on a quarterly basis over time, as a portfolio, it does well. You know, there are always some write-offs, but as a whole, the entire portfolio has actually done very well. And the state considers it to be sort of a, a gem of economic development for the state. Great. Well, I saw a question um, has come in from one of our board members, Bill Height. Um, who would actually administer the fund under the proposal? And you may have addressed this, but is it Treasury? Who would be the administrator of the fund? And maybe I could take that. The way the legislation is drawn is Department of Health and Human Services would pass the, enact the rules governing the program. And the Treasury Department would pay an important role in setting the interest rates and governing the manner in which the bonds are uh, set, how, consulting with HHS. But we've modeled this program very much on the green bond and um, many other programs. The federal government also has gigantic trillion dollars of six and a half trillion dollars worth of very similar bonds outstanding to support mortgage finance. And in, in my line of work, we, we know how to do this. 
big banks know how to do this, small banks know how to do this, Wall Street knows how to do this. Each bond would be put together by an underwriter and the taxpayer's interest would be protected by a trustee working on behalf of the bondholders and the federal government. But the credit really was going to take only FDA clearance combined with a demonstration of credit worthiness to be eligible for financing. There doesn't need to be an office of blah, blah, blah to make this work. The market will make it work under rules set by HHS and Treasury. Well, I, I have um, more questions as always, but um, let me turn to my colleague, Terry Schwartzbeck to just to make sure that we're not missing any that have come through the Q and A. Yeah, thanks, Ellie. Uh, we do have one question that's come in. And just a reminder, folks can type those in to click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Um, one question, why do you want to use bio bonds instead of long-term bonds resembling traditional corporate bonds and providing a source of low-cost investment in translational science? Uh, the questioner adds, evidence suggests that the risk of clinical development can be effectively mitigated by investing in sufficiently large numbers of products. We're calling them bio bonds because these are targeted bonds. They are exactly like corporate bonds, but as the questioner doubtless knows, most companies eligible for these bonds or desiring to get them are way too small to access the corporate debt market. The corporate debt market, even the corp collateralized loan obligation market, um, which is a variation on that theme, does not reach down to the scale of one, 10, 15, or even $50 million. You need to be much bigger than that. We, the portfolios are diversified. That's one of the key protections for taxpayers along with, as Ben says, um, other safeguards we've built into the bill. But this is modeled on well-known bond structures in which there are many, many loans. Green bonds are one, mortgage finance bonds from Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, student loan market, corporate loan market. There are loads and loads of bonds out there. And those are the models on which we base this, but we're calling them bio bonds because that's what they would be. Not green bonds, not mortgage backed securities and not corporate loans. Perfect. Let me ask a quick question. Um, and I know we've had uh, the beginnings of a discussion about this. Um, instead of a peer review mechanism of any kind, um, you use eligibility for NDA. Basically, it's gotten to the FDA clinical trial process um, as a marker for you know, promising research. Do you have any sense of um, how much of a financing gap exists once you reach that point in the, in the R&D pipeline? I mean, you're already pretty far along. You've already attracted some investment ostensibly. Ben, I think we've, we've looked at a lot of research on this and particularly because COVID has hurt so many clinical trials, there's not only a gap, but there's a yawning gap because we're still swimming upstream to repair the damage COVID did to, clin to clinical trials. Yeah, and I think the other issue is that, you know, the costs go up exponentially as you get in the clinic. So, you know, it takes a certain amount of money to get to the IND, but then the costs just keep going up and up. And so you couple that with delays um, it, it can be really, it's hard to get, get around from being behind the eight ball, you know, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but the costs just keep going up. And so having another funding vehicle to, to come in at this stage makes the most sense. It's a great answer. Um, Terry, you know, I have more questions. So <laughs> let me turn back to you first. Yes, had to unmute. Um, would another question that's come in is, would it be possible to provide a case study or illustration of how this would work and how it differs from existing forms of funding? We have um, a good deal of documentation on this, how it would work. Um, we expect early on, and we want the market to determine this. So the legislative language Congressman Rush is going to introduce will allow the market to determine whatever bond structures it wants. We would expect that the immediate choice would be what are called zero coupon bonds in which long-term investors like insurance companies are very willing to wait for their interest payments as long as they have certainty about the principal and are paid a reasonable return. And these are very low cost funding uh, devices. And, and that's the model we would expect would be, would be needed because as Ben says, 
the costs go up, we would need the borrowers, you know, to, to fund themselves adequately with these loans and have the capacity to repay and then go back into the market and get more, more loans for bigger amounts of money as their credit capacity and the research advances. Karen, if the research fails, the research what fails. Is, I mean, if they need, yeah, please. Sorry, go ahead, Ellie. No, I was just going to say, I'm just wondering how they, what credit worthiness means, given that they are ostensibly working at a, with a product that, that entails risk. There's still, this is the real difference. There is, a, and this is part of the taxpayer protection and why the cost of the funding is so low. You would still have to repay the loan. And we think this is ideal for researchers in universities where there are other income streams. Uh, through foundations where there are um, philanthropic resources and in small companies where they have multiple um, projects going on, but there is an obligation to repay. And in the event the borrower is not able to repay, the government would claim collateral, just like you know, if you don't pay your mortgage, the government takes your house, which would be in the form of intellectual property. So it, it is a loan. As I said, it's not may not be right for everyone, but it, it's, an, it's a much lower cost source of funding, and that allows researchers to keep the fruits of their labor far more effectively and foundations to realize returns that can then be used for what contributors are gaining as opposed to having to, to share a significant percentage of it with third parties. Terry, other questions? Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of uh, the broader funding landscape for biomedical research, are there any concerns that the availability of this funding would undermine justification for expanding appropriations for basic biomedical research? Ben? Um, because, I mean, I will, can I just, I think it's just, let me add one thing. It, it, it's very really important to understand that when guarantees, guarantees are scored under something called the Federal Credit Reform Act. And this bill would cost essentially nothing. We really expect the Congressional Budget Office to score it at essentially zero, other than some small startup costs. Because the risk to the federal government is low. We've worked with CBO on this. So it, it's not taking a nickel from NIH or anybody else because using a guarantee as opposed to direct spending is enormously efficient in the federal budget. I would Thanks. just add that we always viewed this uh, as very complimentary. Um, my boss is very, very supportive of all the dollars we give to NIH. He wants to continue to give those dollars. Um, and this would just be in addition. Um, this would definitely not be considered to be in a, instead of the fundings we've already, we are traditionally considering. Your boss is, is such a champion, um, unquestioned champion of NIH. And I think that that goes to the way that this is structured to be at the towards the end of the pipeline um, and rather than at the fundamental stage or right next, right next to it. So um, we're so appreciative of him. Great, another question then. Um, if it would be great to explain uh, who makes the decisions on what projects are able to move forward. Does it, is it simply a matter of who's able to meet financial obligations or credit worthiness or are there factors of uh, the integrity of the research or patient need? Great question. And shall I take that? Yeah, why don't you take that one too? Yeah. No, it's credit worthiness. The FDA clearance is what we wanted. We really did not want this to be, and again, like the venture capital or the other, their other processes are looking at the integrity of the science. That is really expensive. You need a lot of experts. That's why this is credit worthiness. It's cheaper money but you have to pay it back. And if, if the science is, is not successful, the, the researcher still has the obligation to repay. We have an entry level threshold for integrity and credibility. And after that, um, it'll move forward. And we hope that that will actually move forward research that sometimes uh, people are skeptical about. You know, uh, As you well know, there are often just tremendous ideas that seem to come out of nowhere where conventional wisdom would not have approved them in a typical peer review process. So we're hoping that this is not just a lower cost method for funding, but one that will also permit innovative research that eventually still has to move through the FDA IND process to go into the, um, out to, into the, the patients but that we can see new research being funded outside the traditional channels. Great. 
Terry? Yeah, I think we might have just one more. One more, sure. Um, how do you see biobonds working with uh, President Biden's proposal for HARPA or ARPA-H and the goals of that agency, or would they be completely separate? Lauren? I believe we're looking for any path forward. If the president is moving forward with biomedical research, we want this proposal to be out there and to um, make sure that it's on the administration's uh, radar and any sort of combination we can do with what the president is proposing is something we're very, very interested in pursuing. Terrific. Um, you know, this has been, I, I'm sorry, it's been such a quick conversation. It'll be one that continues. Um, I think it's important for our members to know that our job, and we see it as our role, um, is to gather input from you all um, we haven't taken a position. We, we on, the, on this proposal, we haven't taken a position on um, ARPA-H or HARPA. What we do have a strong position on is that this kind of ingenuity, this kind of thinking is the kind of thinking that'll get us to medical progress faster. So, um, but the devil is always in the details and that's what the purpose of these convenings are. Um, to hear from you, to think through this, and more to come um, on these proposals. It's, it's really a privilege um, to be part of a coalition like this, where we really think together on um, complex but really important issues like this one. Um, and with that, I'd really like to thank um, Lauren, Karen, and Ben from joining up, for joining us. And again, um, uh, you saw the sign-on letter in the chat, and, and you know you can always email. I think Ben, uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm guessing that you, you know, an email um, to you with more questions would be appropriate. Absolutely. Is that is, is that cool? Yeah. Okay, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And I would beautiful. just, um, if that's okay, the, uh, this is a really complicated oh. issue. I think the ask, the the reason why it's necessary is really really simple, and that's why my boss is so excited about it. But as you said, the devil's always in the details. Um, and as offices are getting so many requests for bills and letters, um, the, a broad coalition of support from organizations can really make it easier to get members to sign on, um, which is why uh, any support you all are able to give on this letter, it would be so, so helpful. Um, it really is kind of a symbol if we can get a broad coalition of support on how important this bill is, which makes it easier to get bipartisan co-sponsors, which is something my boss is really interested in. And it's also a symbol to the committees of jurisdiction, both energy and commerce and financial services that uh, this is an issue that should move forward and will help get the support um, to move it forward through committee. Terrific. Well said. <laughs> um, well, thanks you all. I think we are um, needing to move to part two of our program, but this was just terrific. And thanks for the generosity of your time and for sharing this information with us. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much thanks for having me. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Ben. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Great. Um, now we are joined by Dr. Albert Renz. Renz? Renz? I should know this. <laughs> it's actually Renz. And um, we have already sung your praises, Dr. Renz. So um, I'll just start off by saying, uh, tell us about your experience over the course of COVID. Give us, um, give us a kind of an insider's look into your life and the life of a community hospital in the midst of this. Uh, crisis. Yeah, sure. Happy to. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. good. So, so the only disclosure I have before addressing you is that uh, Ellie graduated with a higher GPA from William and Mary than I did. <laughs> that is such no, not the truth. I, it, it might it, it might be completely fabricated, but anyway. So, um, for a little background, uh, I'm a urologist here, uh, uh, working primarily out of Doylestown Hospital. Uh, Doylestown is a community off the uh, Delaware River, sits about 30 miles north of Philadelphia uh, uh, and about 80 miles west of Manhattan. Um, and you can get to our town to the Lincoln Tunnel along 78 in about an hour. And, and that, that will become, you know, kind of a, a, a part of, uh, of this discussion in a minute. I'm not just throwing that out to kind of orient you folks who don't know where Doylestown is. Um, it was back in uh, February of 2020, as you guys will remember, when uh, clearly it appeared that New York City was, was going to have 
uh, its first you know, peak, its first crisis of coronavirus cases. Um, Pennsylvania, uh, we, we didn't record our first case until the 6th of March, but, but in the very last days of February, uh, sitting right here at this desk, I got a call from the hospital CMO saying, you know, could you be over here at lunch? Uh, we're getting a task force together. We, we've, we've got to make, we've got to start planning something. And uh, uh, that, that morning, uh, eight of us uh, met in a room, a conference room in the hospital. There was the head of nursing. There were four of us physicians, each representing different specialties. There were uh, folks from, uh, uh, you know, buildings and operations and uh, hospital security. And we started laying out what was going to be our, you know, kind of plans uh, for managing our patients, depending on, on how serious a wave we'd, we'd see here in our community. And uh, it was a surreal meeting. I mean, usually these are some very level-headed people. Um, and uh, it, was, it was an emotional meeting. You know, we didn't know what we were uh, uh, to expect, um, nor were we equipped to handle it. So we established this task force and initially it was all about logistics. You know, let's, let's check in and see what our stock of, of PPE is. Uh, are we able to, if we have to, ventilate two patients from one ventilator? Uh, do we have ICU beds? When the ICU beds are overrun, what becomes the next critical care floor? At what point, uh, uh, based on the daily census of COVID patients in hospital, do we need to shut down other operations? Uh, to preserve resources. Um, so that, that was kind of our initial uh, uh, kind of task at hand. Um, but, but one thing that's unique, because we, we are an independent hospital, a not-for-profit hospital, but we are not affiliated with any major university or any other foundation. Um, so at that meeting, we all kind of discussed what we had heard about COVID and, and how it was likely spread. And and we all left that meeting with uh, a mask mandate for our hospital community. We all agreed, even you know, well before the CDC mandated mask wearing, that it just made perfect sense that everybody coming into the hospital, every patient in a bed, every respiratory therapist or you know, person working in the food service, there would be no face-to-face -face contact with patients or with other staff. And 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 uh, you know, we we didn't have to pass that through committee. We didn't have to. Uh, get approval from anybody. It was, you know, we were, because we're nimble and small, we were able to institute that right away. Um, and then March came and, uh, and, and we started to, to see what was happening uh, in New York and, and, and out in Washington state. Um, the first death in Pennsylvania was recorded on the 18th of March, three days after the governor closed all public schools. Uh, and a day after that first death, then all non-essential businesses were, were closed. So um, those early days, I recall kind of coming to and from the hospital, uh, you know, in record time, uh, the roads uh, between my home and where I work were eerily quiet. Uh, there was very little activity outside of, of the hospital. The parking lot was probably uh, a fifth full. Uh, and walking into the hospital, a place where, where I am generally most comfortable, um, was like walking into a bit of a hostile environment. Um, we, we had masks on. Uh, we thought we knew some things about how we could best keep ourselves and then our families at home safe. Um, but, but we were lacking the ability you know, to test. If you remember going way back to the beginning, you know, testing was a major issue. Um, you know, we, we, when we swabbed patients here, those swabs went, went out to a, a university hospital downtown. We, it would take us four or five days to get results back uh, on a COVID patient or a suspected COVID patient. So our hospital through the emergency room was quickly filling up with kind of, you know, pending diagnoses. There were some patients that proved to be negative, some were positive, but if you came in with a presumptive diagnosis of COVID, you went up to one of the COVID ICUs or one of the secure wards. Well, then three days later, your test comes back negative. Now you've been exposed on that ward, but now you're going back to the general population in the hospital. So we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants and, and, and without the kind of you know, hard data that we usually like to make clinical decisions. 
Um, and then as, as things really started to kind of uh, uh, heat up, uh, the task force had to kind of pivot in terms of what our tasks were. Uh, we had one arm that, that was just on the phone day and night trying to get us PPE that we were quickly running out of. And we found ourselves bidding against uh, uh, other hospitals in our county, which was ridiculous. You know, we'd, we'd get a purchase order and then find out that it was canceled because we were outbid by a hospital down the road. So there was not a very collaborative sense at that time. And we really felt that we were, were kind of on our own. Um, you know, you were just you're talking about scientific research. Well, uh, papers were coming to publication for the first time that I can ever remember in my career without being vetted. The idea was get this information out. And so, so articles were coming at us fast and furious. We had, we had three people who were just scanning the literature. We were trying to find out what, what was going to be our, our therapeutic plan for patients coming in. Was steroids a, a good thing or, a, or were they a bad thing? Uh, hydroxychloroquine, what are the merits there? Should we start everybody on that? What about blood thinners, heparin? People seem to be clotting. I mean, the stuff was coming, coming at, at such a quick clip that, uh, that we had people just, just reading articles uh, and, and then texting us and we were actually changing our established care plan. Um, you know, we, uh, we had um, uh, folks that, uh, you know, were in charge of evaluating our resources and, and it was in late uh, uh, April or actually mid-April, I was in charge of surgical services and, and we stopped all elective procedures at the time. Um, it was a, a, a decision I was kind of proud that the hospital administration allowed us to make because that's their bread and butter. Um, and a lot of hospitals in the area were continuing to do uh, outpatient elective surgeries. We were very quick and early to, to, to cut that off. Um, I've worked in this hospital my entire career after having left my residency. Um, I've always been proud of, of, of my colleagues um, and, and, and the support staff at the hospital. Uh, but I've got to tell you that, you know, when I was coming in and, and working in the ICU in, in April and May uh, and passing in the ICU, the, the people who were with a mop bucket were delivering food. It was like, wow, you know, they were showing up to work as well. They were dedicated, and and it it impressed me greatly that 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 people with some of the less glamorous jobs in a hospital, you know, took their responsibility seriously, knew they they were an integral part of what we were delivering to our patients, and uh, and it was a, a bonding moment. Uh, you know, our community, we you can imagine if we're an independent hospital, we enjoy some some good community support, and and where we are and. In Pennsylvania, there are a lot of uh, uh, big pharma executives, and um, uh, through their connections, uh, uh, funds were raised. They were very generous. Um, we had uh, local carpenters and handymen dropping off N95s um, when we most needed them. You can imagine how crazy is that? Guys were coming by in a pickup truck and and dropping off eight or ten N95s, and and that was like, you know, that was a major score. <laughs> um, we, we, were, we were able, uh, we, uh, our head of pharmacy was very uh, uh, forward thinking and aggressive and, and we clearly saw that we were going to run out of N95s and uh, we were able to procure a, a machine that used hydrogen peroxide uh, to re-sterilize our N95. So everybody who wore them, whenever we were in contact with a COVID patient, that N95 would be put into this uh, uh, sterilizer. And we wore them, you know, 30 uses instead of the one that, you know, it was supposed to be used. Um, gloves, booties, we lost all of those things. People were walking around in trash bags uh, on their feet. I mean, like, you know, I, I do some volunteer work in the in in in, in emerging uh, uh, economies uh, in West Africa, and it was it was surreal. It was like it was like I was back there uh, in this affluent community in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, we were, we were struggling and, um, and making do as best we could with what we had. So I think that I was invited by Ellie to, to kind of share the, this experience with you guys because um, we were just talking last week and, and I kind of told her how, you know, she asked, well, how are you? And I said, I think the word I used was either, you know, beleaguered or, or you know, we, we're, we're just, you know, we were just, it was a, it was a tough year for us uh, emotionally and physically. And, 
um, and probably uh, no more difficult on anyone than, than our nurses who, who provided you know, supreme care to our patients, but were, were, were tasked with, with you know, ushering people to death uh, uh, on an on a, on a iPad you know, speaking to family out in the parking lot who are out in the parking lot because they want to be as, as close to their dying family members as they can be. Um, you know, normally, of course, that's, 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 you know, you're surrounded by your community of loved ones at your bedside, but here people were dying alone and, and the nurses were there, you know, listening to those conversations and people saying goodbye. It was, you know, heartbreaking. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we, we, you know, we, we as time went on, uh, we became innovative. Um, we were able to secure uh, more PPE. Um, but I would tell you that uh, in terms of our emotional uplift, you know, that came, that came in late December when, when hospital staff members and clinicians and, and support folks were downstairs in our main uh, conference room, sleeves rolled up and receiving our first dose of vaccine. Um, you know, I've, 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 I, 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 I am sometimes quick to criticize big pharma. Um, I have a real hard time when I've got patients who forego taking medications that really keep them well because they can't afford them or their, you know, their, 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 their insurance plans are so convoluted, nobody can figure out what's covered and what's not. But, but Big Farm is going to be one of the big heroes here. Uh, you know, that Operation Warp Speed that, that, that Karen referred to earlier um, and the development uh, and the application of this, you know, brilliant science that brought a, a vaccine, you know, to clinical use in record time. And, you know, there, there was a spring in our step again in, uh, in January. We felt, we felt that, you know, for the first time, after you know almost a year of playing defense with this virus, that we were actually you know kind of now going to kind of you know turn this ship around and 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 take a more active role against it, and it was nice to know that uh, that that people who were there every day were were much less likely now to get critically ill you know if exposed and and uh, and fortunately there are no tales here of our medical staff of anybody succumbing to coronavirus. Uh, nor any any uh, any hospital employee, and I think that goes back to some of those early decisions we made. Wow, Al, you mentioned New York. Yeah, uh, yeah. You oh, said that there, you you forgot your. That I part did, of it. I did. I threw it out there, and then I completely forgot you it. Did. Um, you did. You baited us. Yeah. So um, when we started talking about how how we're going to get two patients on a ventilator, it was because of rumors coming out of Northern Jersey that there was gonna be a mass uh, exodus of sick people from New York heading west on I-78 through Northern Jersey and into Pennsylvania for care. We thought we were gonna be overrun by those patients who couldn't get care in New York because the healthcare system there was just you know, overrun itself. Um, so, so there were all of these, when I say that you know, in this room, it got emotional at times and then, and then quickly, you know, we were sitting around at our third meeting saying we shouldn't even be in this room. That was my first introduction, you know, to Zoom. You know, we started then not getting together. Um, but yeah, we were, we were very concerned that, uh, that our community hospital um, was going to have to take care of New Yorkers coming down. And then, and then when, when our community numbers picked up, that we wouldn't have the beds available to treat people in this community. It was, it was a serious concern. Wow. Um, some of it, you know, it, well, and, and fortunately, it just it just never came to pass. And I think a lot of it was a bit of hyperbole, but but there was a real concern. I, I get you. And it goes to what happens the next next time. And that's another thing that you and I talked about a little bit is that you had um, some ideas about how to prepare, um, it, it, at least with PPE and some of the supplies. Right, right, right. You had mentioned. Yeah, so, so what Ellie's referring to is when we were talking, I said, look, you know, I've, there's a, a small town in the early kind of Pocono Mountains called Tobihanna. Uh, and in Tobihanna, Pennsylvania, there's an army depot there. And it's a massive site with, with limited, limited personnel. There are a few barracks, but it's basically, you know, acre after acre of, of, uh, of, of equipment and uh, uh, munitions and 
Um, you can tell that the stuff that's there now was, was the stuff that was left over from Desert Storm because before that, uh, before that, 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 that military operation, all the Jeeps were, that were up there were painted, you know, that green and beige, and now they were all, you know, kind of white and beige for that desert camouflage. Um, but, it, but, but, you know, the, the problem here also is that, you know, we're all, we're all used to um, environmental disasters uh, that take place in different regions, whether they're fires, you know, mudslides, floods, uh, and different parts of the country can mobilize and, and help out our, our, our brothers and sisters. You know, here we were all in the soup at the same time and, and, and nobody, I can tell you, nobody was gonna give up any, any PPE or ventilator that they had. Um, so I really think that there's an opportunity for us to, to look long and hard at, at some kind of stockpiling of IV fluids, um, basic medications, ventilators, PPE uh, in these regional depots, which I'm sure exist all across the country, um, so that, that we can quickly mobilize and we have a, the availability to gain access in short time to some of those things that uh, you know, were, were, were vitally essential and, and sorely lacking. Great. Well, I think that there are some questions coming in. So let me invite Terry to join us. Terry, are there questions before yeah, I go to my- Yeah, sure do. Here? Yeah, and again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rennes, for sharing your story and uh, for this case study. Um, do you think uh, what you learned by making and modifying decisions in real time during the pandemic, uh, that clinical uptake of recent and current research maybe will move more quickly and speed bench to bedside process? That's a great question and, and, and really pertinent to what, what you guys focus on. Uh, and I think the answer is yes. You know, it's always, you know, once you've kind of dipped your toe in the water uh, and have kind of, you know, bucked uh, the traditional system, it's easier to, to do then again and again. Uh, I think, I think when, when, you know, when, when all is said and done and, and we dust ourselves off and, and we sift through those papers and, and try to decide, you know, what percentage of it proved to be accurate, what percentage of it was valuable, um, wh what, what led us astray um, and maybe injured patients. If, if we find that the vast majority of uh, or if we find that you know that 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 the you know the needle points toward hey this is this is beneficial that yeah I think you'll see that that it will speed uh, that that sometimes you know uh, frustratingly slow process. Great and uh, just another question generally how's everything going with vaccinations are you are, are how are things going in terms of getting it out and acceptance in your area? Yeah well yeah you know, I I don't think we're we're any different than. Than, than most communities, um, we um, we're 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 not so politically polarized, but we've you know we've got our share of people who hang on to some some pretty tough to believe theories or misconceptions. Um, but for the most part, we we are kind of in an area where there are a lot of elderly, and and they were very quick to come out. Uh, and our hospital, you know, mobilized. We had. Uh, uh, an outpouring of retired nurses who staff clinics day and night, and, and uh, we've done a terrific job. Right now, I think, I think like most of the country, P Pennsylvania's, uh, I think about uh, almost 40% of people who are seeking vaccine have gotten both doses now, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, it's always funny when 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 I'm sitting here with a patient and we talk about, well, I say, well, you know, have you been vaccinated? And then they'll, they'll go on like they know my politics and, and they'll talk to me as though I'm in their camp. And, and I'm like, no, no, that's, see, that's wrong. You've got to get vaccinated. Everybody you love has to get vaccinated. That's the only way through here, you know, through, through some of those knuckleheads who don't want to get vaccinated, through them contracting it and hopefully not getting too ill. You know, we'll, we'll get to herd immunity one way or the other. But, you know, I think, I think, I think we're going to crawl to the end of this. It's not going to be a sudden finish. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, right now, as I sit here with you guys uh, in my ICU, I have only two patients with COVID who are ventilated uh, only for the first time, for the first time in three months, fewer than 10 COVID patients. So that's encouraging. And, uh, and we know with the vaccine, uh, you know, it, it does prevent the serious illness. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't be in that situation where we were 
where we were kind of frantically looking to obtain or preserve, you know, our, our vital resources here in the hospital. Do you have more questions, Terry? I certainly do. Oh yeah, go ahead, Ellie. No, yeah. Oh, okay, just a really quick one. In terms of ventilation, Al, and, yeah. and this is a broader question that I know you'll know the answer to this. Um, over the course of COVID, did the, the risk of death once you were ventilated go down? Has there been improvements at that stage? Yeah, so that's, that's really a great question. Um, so what, one thing that, and I think we talked about this, Ellie, one thing that we did learn uh, through one of those kind of, you know, uh, rapidly circulated papers was how to, how to improve ventilation and, and oxygenation on a patient who was already intubated, but was still failing. Uh, and that was that whole, you know, kind of concept of proning, you know, taking, you know, normally, you know, if you look at any TV show and someone's in an ICU bed and they've got a you know, a tube down their throat, they're on their back and face up to the ceiling. And, and, and that's supine and that's how we have always ventilated patients. But, but studies came out to show that, you know, if you took these critically ill patients and for eight hours a day, turned them prone onto their bellies face down, that that took a lot of pressure off the back of the lungs and helped them uh, to mobilize fluids and oxygenate better. And uh, so we, we, we adapted that and it was, it was crazy to see and, and, and how we did it. You know, it took six of us at a bedside with a respiratory therapist and we wrapped these patients in blankets and almost like, you know, a, a papoose and, and on, on three, we turned them over. And um, uh, so, so uh, we, we, you know, we, we, right. Cause right there were those early reports saying that, you know, once you were intubated, forget it, you know, and, if, and in fact, it, it made people sicker and they died quicker. So avoid intubation if you can, I think, I think that was just a matter that we didn't we didn't understand the mechanisms of COVID pneumonia like we do now. Um, uh, what what we did learn was that uh, you know the greatest you know so so here we had we had patients in our ICU with you know quote unquote no premorbid factors. What, why are they so sick and and why are they intubated and not doing well? And and it just became clear that one of those early kind of non-discussed issues also was the the, the, the uh, uh, complicating factor of obesity or, or more importantly, morbid obesity. Um, our ICUs were, you know, that, those were our sickest patients and, our, and most of our patients who died uh, had that as a, a pre-existing condition. And that was really tough uh, to, to manage and to get around. Great, and actually here's a similar question. Um, broadly, you've talked about how you guys uh, took up the information about things like proning. Um, how overall was the hospital and its providers able to assimilate other new data about COVID-19 into treatment plans? Um, it's just, it's difficult to imagine how you could just constantly have to revise and re-revise treatment approaches. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, hearing you kind of say that, but yeah, it, it, it was exhausting. And when I say we had, you know, one arm of our task force, I, I mean, they were reading three or four papers a day. And I would tell you that every, every two or three days, we were, we were revising our, our, our order sheets. So for the pharmacists, you know, stuff, we were, we were, we were adding stuff and taking stuff off. Um, you know, we have these kind of, you know, clinical guidelines that we like to use for best practices. And, um, and that was part of our job. So uh, I would tell you for, for two months, uh, uh, any of us on the task force, you know, we, we didn't get good sleep. Uh, you know, we were, we were constantly being updated, you know, getting, getting emails and, and, and paper sent. And, and so we'd have to review them in the middle of the night and then weigh in in the morning. And um, uh, it, was, it, 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 was, it was nice, it was nice to, to you know, have access to the world literature. Remember, this was not just, you know, this is not just, a, this is a pandemic. You know, right. a lot of the things that I'm talking about are not things that came from hospitals out West or down South. These are things that were coming from Spain and Italy and and Ireland and, uh, uh, and, 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 and China and Japan and South Korea. Um, so it was really, it was really nice to, to have access to that. Um, but, but to say that there was information overload and then, you know, um, how, you know, before, you know, we, we often had this discussion, look, but before we, before we change our treatment plan, maybe we need to see how it goes for three or four days. I mean, we were, we were, we were pivoting that quickly. So, you, so the problem, you know, that's not good science, right? 
to right. kind of keep making right. changes and then and then trying to figure out at the end right. well what was what was the you know what was the preferred treatment um, but but we didn't have that luxury and I think to, to me that was the, like I said that was the most unusual aspect of this whole pandemic was how we were making decisions um, on the fly that were that were critically important to to these patients and the family who love them with 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 you know with very little to base base those decisions on and and arguably with more emotion uh, in those decisions than we should have allowed. Wow. Do you have other questions, Terry? Yeah, another question. Um, and this is a this similar is building on this. Was there, yeah, yeah, this can be the last one. Um, was there any effort at a national or regional level to cooperate on the assimilation of all these nutrients? No. Protocols? <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, um, one of those other, you know, one of those other things, um, and we'll, we'll end on this, is, is there was there was no there was no top down um, uh, direction, advice, guidance, plan, structure. Um, when I say we were we were on our own, I mean, we, we were we were at sea. Uh, uh, in a boat, we were on our own. There was no help. There was no one to call for help. You know, we, we there was no one. There was no one. You know, we were gonna we were gonna get ourselves out of this, uh, or we weren't. Um, so wow. there was no there was no big brother to phone or or you know say hey uncle we're 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 no longer too proud. Come in and help us out. There, there was nothing. So so I think I think um, you know my 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 personal opinion too is that we allowed we there there was there was so much. Um, fertile ground for conspiracy theories and all, because there were, we, we, there was no one voice speaking here. You know, when this started, I remember talking to friends of mine who are not in healthcare, saying, you know, I guess what we're going to soon see is, you know, the Surgeon General getting on TV every night at nine o'clock, and and as Americans, we can all tune in and and hear, you know, this is what we know, this is what we learned today, this is what we're planning to do tomorrow. Um, I still find it remarkable that that nothing like that happened. Um, you know, this was this was a, a national crisis, um, and and for there not to be one platform uh, where 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 information, valuable, unemotional information, was being delivered to me is is one of the striking kind of deficiencies of of, of whatever plans uh, the government rolled out. And it's an opportunity. Oh, absolutely, for that never Another, to happen uh, again. Uh, Another opportunity as well. You know, I, I think back to the days, right, when you you hear your parents telling the stories of sitting around listening to FDR on the radio, right? Um, you know, we, we didn't have that voice, um, and and so then, you know, so then, you know, so so if 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 if, if experts don't have that platform to speak, then then experts don't have a voice. And I think the saddest thing of of 2020 to me is is it became the year that experts didn't matter. Wow. Well, I, it would be nice to, do you have a joke or something you could tell? Wow. The so, joke was that you graduated with a higher GPA than me. <laughs> that was a huge joke. See, see, I'm like the comedian. I come right back. I start with that and bring it back at the end. That's my only joke. Wow. So, well, sorry to be such a heavy. Wow. That was kind of heavy. No, no, no. Thank yeah. you for your candor. That's what we're looking for. And, sure. um, and you know, your insights. Uh, and uh, I think we're at, we're at the end, unfortunately, yeah. but but we yeah. so appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, and thanks to you all, our members. And um, if you have a second, just these are our next guests. Um, Carolyn Clancy, who you all know, acting deputy um, VA. Emily Halubowicz, our appropriations and budget expert is joining us. And Dr. Ned Sharpless, who is the head of um, National Cancer Institute the following week. So. Tune in and um, thanks for your partnership. Thanks and for having we'll, uh, me. Sign off. Thanks, Al. Bye.